Continuing our interview with Glenn Roseberry, missionary to Africa from Kingdom Driven Ministries at kingdomdriven.org. Today we're talking about what a day is like living as a missionary in the jungle slash bush of Africa. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. This is going to be a ministry spotlight edition. I'm continuing a multi-part interview with Glenn Roseberry from Kingdom Driven Ministries at KingdomDriven.org. In the very first podcast, we found that Glenn gave up his comfortable life in America to go live with the poor in Africa and make disciples according to the Luke chapter 10 model. He lives with the poor, and he does one-on-one discipleship training, which in turn makes other disciples that make other disciples. This interview comes from a series of Voxes, which is kind of like a walkie-talkie app. Um, It makes it easier to communicate with a missionary in the jungle of Africa. You will often hear chickens in the background, or maybe some people laughing, and sometimes the subject might abruptly change. But this is because he's doing the interview over a few days using the Voxer app. And he lives on a farm in the bush slash jungles of Africa. So without further ado, here is the Voxer interview with Glenn Roseberry, Missionary to Africa. You are going global for Jesus with ComradeRocks.net. We come poor and live poor among the poor to reach the poor. Uh, so what, what I basically do is the best of my ability, and, and of course I'm not perfect at it, I live like the Africans do. Most of the missionaries I come in contact with, they, they come here, and, and they're even trained here, and they come and they move into a real safe place, and they uh, have a wall around their uh, house. And, uh, and, you know, if you got kids, that's, that's the way to go. You know, when I'm in Nairobi, I live a couple of miles out of the slums. The only reason I don't live in the slums is they tell me I would just be brutalized at night being robbed. But uh, in the daytime, the thieves kind of lay low. And so I have to live a couple of miles out of the slum. I have an apartment in Nairobi, and I work in the slums there as well, as well as a refugee area uh, area called Eastley. I have house churches among the persecuted. I work with three former moms that have come to Christ. So, uh, you know, for a long time, um, particularly when I first uh, got here, uh, I lived with a uh, family uh, that was rather upper middle class for Africa and realized very quickly they weren't going to embrace my model, which I'll describe to you in a few moments. So I I found some people that were interested in working with me up here in this end of Tanzania, and I lived in a goat stall for uh, four months. Then they gave me a piece of land, and I built a little house on it. So anyway, right now I live in a little shack kind of looking thing. Um, there's cracks in the wall. I can see through the walls and the walls don't go up to the ceiling. And um, uh, I live in rural Tanzania, uh, kind of, I wouldn't call it the bush. The bush is about 10 kilometers from here. I live right on the edge of the jungle, basically. And uh, we have uh, elephants a couple of kilometers from here. They still come out and bother people sometimes. At one point, they killed one of my neighbors. He was out drunk one night, and uh, elephants came onto his shamba. That's what we call our family farms, and came onto the shamba, and he decided to get out with some a sheet or something. He was shaking it at them, not realizing he was shaking it at females and babies and didn't see the bull elephant who came over and, and crushed him, and they like to walk on you a while once they get you on the ground. And, Giraffes no longer come in this area. They've been successful uh, in barriers for those, but you really can't keep elephants out there. They're just so smart and determined and everything. But, uh, you know, we have monkeys. We have everything else. I'm about three kilometers from everything from water buffalo to zebra. and We have everything but lions. I live just outside of National Park, and there's no fences. So things get over here sometimes. We have a huge amount of leopards, uh, but they stay in the park because they're such a uh, huge... Um, cadre of monkeys to feed on, we'll say. You're listening to an interview with Glenn Roseberry, missionary to Africa. What is it like in the day-to-day life of being a missionary in the jungles of Africa? Continuing on. We've been going through this transition period where we've added uh, 
numerous, I shouldn't say numerous, we've added additional uh, house churches and, uh, and new disciples at a rate where we're, we're, we're really outgrowing our leadership to the extent that we have really got to get some guys to the next level, you know, in, in discipleship the way we do it, uh, you know, which is real one-on-one discipleship and very small group discipleship. Um, it, it, it's time intense, you know, Jesus spent three and a half years primarily with 12 guys. There was another group of 70, of course, that he, that he engaged in ministry and all. We use that Luke 10 model, uh, which I'm sure I'll get around to in all of my sharing here. And, but you know, that's a very intense way to do things. You know, Jesus, uh, you know, at first, uh, he went out and, and preached the good news of the kingdom. Then he selected, uh, he had disciples. He selected 12 of them to pour his life into. Uh, and what he basically did is they watched him do it. And then uh, they basically did it with him. And then he sent them out in front of him and he followed up behind them and he observed them and then gave them feedback. Well, you know, we mimic those steps because we believe Jesus was the master disciple maker. So uh, what that means is, is that, you know, we do it first, uh, we do it with them. And then, of course, the next step is, is that they go out and do it kind of as we observe uh, and then fi- and then we give feedback and then continually mentor and discipleship <clears throat> and disciple them as they are, in fact, uh, doing the work that, uh, of the Lord. I uh, got my day started earlier than I wanted to. Speaking of what's a day like, uh, sometime between three and five, I'm typically up. I actually go to bed about, in, get in the bed about 7.30 at night and rarely are uh, awake after nine. Um, you know, we're, I live on a farm in an area where very few people have electricity and I'm just kind of on the same schedule, you know, by the time it's been dark an hour, you know, when there, you don't have any light, people are pretty much turning the old lantern out and going to sleep, having eaten. So, uh, you know, I live the same lifestyle they do. However, I find I get up quite a bit earlier because, you know, I I do have farm chores. You know, I live on a farm. Uh, We call it a shamba here, which is a um, traditionally that would be a, a, a kind of a family farm that's passed down generation to generation. At one time, they were each a hect acre or eight acres. And you would raise your family on there. And as you had sons and and family, you know, they would all share that land. And, uh, of course, you can get overcrowded pretty quick that way. Uh, that's kind of the, the way we do things in the bush. And when I say bush, let me qualify that. I, I, I'm almost jungle here. Uh, we are right on the edge of uh, a massive, uh, uh, what is now a, a national park, Colorado National Park. Uh, which I have no idea how many acres or miles it is, but um, basically uh, within three miles of me is, um, you know, every kind of animal that's in Africa, basically, you know, from crocodiles to um, leopards and elephants and giraffes and all those things. Uh, The only thing we don't have on this side of the mountain uh, is lions, praise the Lord. Uh, lions are herd centric, so they're always looking after herds. They don't hunt as loners, nor do they hunt single prey, but rather, you know, strategically hunt it against large herds. And so as a result, the uh, biggest cats around here are actually leopards, which are way more dangerous. However, the food supply is so high in our area, the wildlife is so robust that just the monkey population is in the hundreds of thousands. I mean, the, the leopards in the area could never you know, run out of monkeys alone, forget anything else they might want to feed on. So uh, they don't ever come out of the park and bother anybody. In fact, in generations, they have not done that. Our greatest danger here, this far from the park, is elephants who are quite fierce and and territorial and come out of their territory and want to come into yours. And uh, since the area is so ideal for elephants, they're constantly birthing. So they're always in defense mode because they always have young with them. So they're the bulls in particular are fierce. Uh, So they're always in just protection mode and they just, you know, someone gets killed about every year around here. When you get close to the park, then water buffaloes come into play. You just can't go in the park without a guide with a gun, not not to shoot anything, but to fire it in the air because the water buffaloes just, you know, uh, they're just 
incredibly dangerous. We had a young boy killed here this this past year. You know, we've got this wildlife element to, to here. But, you know, I start early in the morning because, uh, you know, I literally have chickens and goats and rabbits. So I get up and take care of a lot of the early morning chores. But I do have workers that come. So uh, basically, my, I'll give you a little synopsis of my day. So, you know, I'm going to get up and have my time with the Lord and, and pray personally and uh, and have my uh, my time also to answer any important emails. I try not to get computer focused at all uh, unless there's something big going on that I have to that I know I've got to respond to. I, I really try to keep my day focused on the mission and, and try to not be distracted by the West uh, or by you know, uh, social media or anything like that. So I try to wake up with the word and prayer. And then after I get my chores done, basically all my guys begin to show up about seven in the morning. That's the plan anyway. Depending on which guys show up first, this may be surprising to some. We, some, we either uh, begin to worship and pray and bring up prayer needs since we are actively witnessing and sharing our faith almost every single day to unbelievers. Once again, using that Luke 10 model where we go two by two and literally down the road into homes, uh, into villages, and just find a person of peace, which I'll define later. It's basically just a person that's open to listen to what you have to say and shows you hospitality. And uh, so we have new people we're engaging every single day almost. And if we're not engaging new people, we're following up with people that were new a week or two or three or four ago. So uh, we're in this mode all the time of actively evangelizing. And uh, so we have many people to pray for. We're constantly making and changing lists and praying for people. Uh, we have to do a lot of spiritual warfare here. Uh, this is an area where witchcraft and uh, things like that are actively done. All of East Africa is that way, by the way. I shouldn't say this area. That is just the... Uh, just the way it is here, Tanzania and Kenya in particular uh, are loaded uh, with witch doctors. We have uh, a lot of demonic uh, influences and things that we have to deal with. So um, we do a lot of spiritual warfare type prayer in battle. And uh, we're praying for one another. And really the purpose of our coming together uh, is for consecration. We are just convinced that... Uh, we just must concentrate ourselves. Um, we have learned to say no so we can say yes. So we're constantly saying no to distractions and no to things that would interfere with our core mission so we can say yes to our core mission. So we meet, and this is a time of prayer. Every We go around the room, every single person prays, and every single person discusses their challenges, and we don't care how long this takes, really. It typically takes... 30 minutes to an hour and a half. It just, you know, there is no format. And uh, and then I, oh, and I told you earlier, I would probably surprise you with this. And then uh, about half of our group then, we exercise together. <laughs> uh, we, um, we do everything from climbing ropes. I'm 62, so I'm not as agile as the other guys, but big believer that in order to, uh, to serve the Lord a long time, I have to take care of myself. So I run, um, climb rope. We work out uh, with uh, body weight exercises. We uh, uh, we watch what we eat. We're per the, particularly uh, about half of our group are very health food conscious and, and try to eat correctly, while at the same time eating what's set before us in this culture. We can rejoice that you know most things that we eat here are all fresh and grown on our own shamba and uh, and our neighbor's shamba. So um, uh, we eat good fresh food. Uh, you know, I, I laugh, you know, in America, everybody's trying to, to buy their food, you know, where it's clean food and, you know, it's healthily raised and all these type of things. And we chuckle, you know, because I walk out my back door and I pick my own bananas and pick up my oranges from the ground. And, you know, I, I get my own eggs out of my own hen house. We milk our own goats. And so <laughs> we grow our own spinach. You know, it's, there's not much danger of uh, processed uh, manufactured food here. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, we even get our own salt, uh, from, you know, just a few hours from here is where they, they you know, they get the salt from the ocean. So uh, it's a really unique environment from that perspective. Uh, you asked me about the climate here. It averages 72 degrees in Tanzania. I live on the 
shoulder, as it were, of Mount Meru um, in the wintertime, which is your summertime. I can see my breath at night, and I have to have two blankets in my bed, and frequently I sleep in my clothes. Uh, my house is basically a shack now. I actually live in a wooden house now. The board, boards on the wall don't actually meet, so the wind can blow in. So I have to bundle up, been known to wear a cap while I'm sleeping. And uh, I tell people uh, it's just like camping out, no big deal. And I just camp out all my life, you might say. Um, I live just like the locals do, so I, I have basically the same standard of living with, with as much as I can. You know, I do have things they don't have. My water tanks are newer. <laughs> I'm better at catching uh, rainwater off the roof. We have water challenges here. Uh, we have a well on our land. Fluoride is, um, is naturally occurring. Fluoride in the water is at such a level that it's cancerous. It's carcinogenic. Very cancerous, as a matter of fact. Uh, it won't affect me. I'm 62 years old. I mean, you know, but uh, you wouldn't want a child to start drinking it early in life. Uh, by the time they're in their 30s and 40s, too much fluoride literally rots your teeth. It just takes the enamel off and, uh, and causes cancer as well. Uh, a lot of tumors and things like that around here. So uh, what we do is we use that water for irrigation, washing, cleaning, animals, things like that. Anything with a short lifespan, it's fine for. And that would even include up to cattle. Uh, and we basically uh, capture rainwater, and uh, we we filter it still because there's little goodies in our water tanks from time to time, little interesting worms, and so we try to filter those out. I've drank a few worms, of course. We do have a lot of malaria in the area. I mean, people die all the time here from malaria. I've had it three times, and uh, first time I thought I was going to die, but uh, the other two times I handled it quite well. I've learned the symptoms and I get ahead of it on medication when the occasion uh, has, has risen, but we've been blessed in that area. Uh, but anyway, then after all of that, I would, um, uh, we begin our day. And so at this point, I delegate chores for the guys. Uh, and I have uh, about five guys that work on my little farm. We provide food for widows, and that includes everything from growing corn to uh, eggs, meat, beans, uh, fruit. And things like that and so uh they would just come over here and help us farm the land and, and and they basically eat the vast majority of the food that comes off the shamba we have more fruit than anyone could possibly eat so we distribute that out pretty well we're very free with the community with uh anybody in need they're also welcome to come to the shamba and, and actually harvest and work with us and take things off uh we're in a very fertile part of tanzania which is a fertile country in the first place I have, uh, out of those guys that work here, which is four or five guys and one lady that cooks for everybody, uh, I pay a rather meager salary, a few bucks a day, which is actually very nice here. I mean, it's it's more than what most people pay to work on a shamba, uh, probably by double, but still nothing like you could get if you could get a job in town. You know, that would be three times what I pay. But that's that's what it pays to work on a shamba as a common laborer. And uh, but I feed my guys like kings. Uh, they uh, you know they actually get eggs, uh, which no one feeds their workers eggs. Uh, they get milk every day, which no one provides milk every day other than a little splash in their tea. Uh, we have a very well-rounded diet for them, and so uh, they they eat basically like kings compared to any other workers in the area. And so everyone loves that. The guys that are more mature, they only work Mondays and Fridays all day. And then uh, the rest of the week, about Monday, they literally leave the rest of us behind and go out two by two and share their faith every single week. They don't get paid for being disciples or disciple makers, of course. They are able to work on the Shamba for their meager pay. And then they're given tons of free time uh, every Saturday and uh, half a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to go and share their faith. And if they happen to only be able to schedule or see someone on Monday and Friday, then that, that's priority over work in the Shamba. So we would um, have them out in the field all the time. I've got uh, two guys that do this just constantly. And, uh, and we hope that number will, will be at four or six by this time next year, which will be huge. Uh, we have house churches spread all through the area uh, in the surrounding villages. I, I take care of, on a daily basis, uh, two of the house churches and then disciple all the men. I do two of the house churches, one because it's in a newer area, and I'm discipling the guy that's discipling them, and so I just want to be with him. It's part of that 
Luke 10 process, that, that Jesus process to where, you know, he's watched me do it, and now, I'm, uh, now we're doing it together, and the next phase is he'll be doing it without me, and uh, so I'm taking him through those steps. I have a house church that has some widows, almost no men, and I have some women there that are physically disabled, and it's just a special thing in my heart, so um, I had to do two house churches on Sunday, and then I have multiple meetings in the week, and they're my other responsibility. I have just insisted on handling this. I know this sounds odd. You would think that a guy leading a ministry would, uh, you know, only want to lead the uh, his champion men, you know, to uh, discipleship victory. Uh, and I, but you know, I want my champion men that I'm leading to discipleship victory to be out there. And these women, some of them with club feet and things like that, they they can never be out there. So I've just, uh, it is my great joy uh, to be with them every week and give them that time. We meet, you know, typically three times a week together. Most of my discipleship with them, unlike the men, is meeting-oriented. We don't really mix genders in our society here. Uh, Men and women really do things almost separate. We have very defined roles. Uh, Women are are traditional homemakers. Uh, They work hard on the farm. They weed, plant, take care of the animals. I mean, they do the physical labor, way more physical labor than men, unless a man happens to have a trade. A man might pitch in during harvest and planting, but he is not going to do menial work, uh, almost to the point that it's comical, because I do way more manual work than any of the Africans do around here. They just think I'm crazy because I get out and, you know, I get out and do chores and, and i know this sounds funny from a western perspective but they think i do a lot of women's work because you know we're 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 like a throwback to the 40s here as far as, as or even the 30s as far as gender separation on work uh, there's a lot of good in that still because uh, the fellowship among the women is just unbelievable they just have a community that's just second to none because they all do the same things and they all share the chair the same chores and they all know what's going on in each other's shamba because they're always with their neighbors spending time together helping each other out on their other shambas and it's an amazing community experience that the women hold but uh, so anyway our, our gender uh, our lack of gender mixing is a very rich part of our culture and uh, i would tell you that uh uh, that from a guy like me that loves conversation and, and, and has a sense of humor and loves the lighthearted side of life, being with the ladies is way more fun than the guys because men here are, are more serious. Uh, they're, especially as they get older, um, and I don't mean old, old, but I mean as they you know, have children and all, uh, it, it's a serious business here being a man, being responsible for the family, the planning, the uh, figuring out how to provide beyond the food needs. The women really do take care of the food needs, but everything else, actually generating money, which is very hard to do here for things like clothing and school fees and things like that, all falls on them. They're a rather serious lot. Uh, sober uh, would be a good term for the men, and the women are just carefree and just, you know, you would think it would be the opposite. They, You know, these women can put up. 20 liter bucket on their head and one in each arm and walk and have a baby on their back and walk a mile to the water and back uphill both ways and laugh and tell jokes and tease one another and praise the Lord all the way. And, you know, the guys just, uh, their camaraderie is sitting in circles and having serious conversations and, uh, which of course is great for discipleship, by the way, I'm not complaining, but, uh, I would tell you that our, uh, this gender separation thing is is an amazing thing to watch as a Westerner who has never really lived it. Uh, even though I'm 62 years old, as you know, we, you know we've always, uh, even going back to the uh, 50s and 60s, uh, women and men mix socially at a very high level, and it's just not done here. And uh, it's very interesting. We still have arranged marriages and things like that. I've gotten off the off the subject here a bit. I'll go back to what my day is like. Uh, so anyway, so we, uh, we go back to, um, uh, typically I would, uh, have to do logistical things, you know, my part of making sure the things we have to buy, like breads and supplies, fencing, uh, medical supplies for animals and humans and, and things like that. Uh, at this point I've met with my guys, we've spent time in prayer and discipleship together. Now me and perhaps some of the guys would go. 
and would spend the day together uh, taking care of logistical things, perhaps traveling to go to meetings. I have multiple meetings during the week that are formal, but we spend a lot of informal time because we are personally discipling guys, handling issues, everything from marital issues. They would also occasionally be village issues where elders would want to speak to me and, and talk to me. There is, unfortunately, uh, when you're in another country, there can also be a certain amount of a burden of dealing constantly with visas and work permits and things like this from the government. Uh, we're in a season right now where I, an entire day of every week is with me and either in a government office or um, uh, with an attorney or some type of advocate. Uh, many times, very complex conversations where I have to take an interpreter because it's you know you start talking in about topics uh, that are involve uh, the law and and things like this uh, are beyond my normal Swahili that I use for day to day work around the shamba and and purchasing and buying and going and doing things which I'm adept at doing, but when you get out of my shamba context and my sharing with brothers and sisters. You get into a very complex uh, level of Swahili where everything has to be precision uh, focused. You you can't get out and make a, you know, and due to a grammar error, you know, have a big misunderstanding. And the next thing you know, you've wasted weeks or months of work trying to get something approved in a country. Uh, I have an NGO and we're also, we have our own church here. And these things have to be licensed and covered by the government here. The government in Tanzania is a great, great place to be. They're they're very cooperative. Uh, we've got a new leader here, a new president. He's a very law and order guy, and so every every dot I has to be dotted and every T crossed. And uh, we're we're very happy to see him. We pray for him. We love him. He uh, comes from a strong Catholic background. He's a good man. We don't have much corruption here. A lot of corruption compared to the West, but nothing compared to East Africa. We're known as being one of the more a country of great integrity compared to most of our neighbors and uh, i travel in some of the surrounding countries and it's it's appalling sometimes what goes on as the day winds down i'm trying to be back here early in the afternoon mid-afternoon at the latest and then at this point uh really focus on winding down chores and things like this if i've had any meetings during the week i've, I've held them and had them some of my house churches are are a good hour's drive away because you know we've expanded out and uh, we deal with so many cultures. We uh, deal with the Maasai culture, which is a uh, herder culture. They follow cows, uh, very primitive. Um, I have hired guys from the Maasai culture. I have one working on my shama now that literally had never turned a doorknob, could not get in and out of my car, and had never used a toilet. Uh, even now, in the house churches that we have out in the Kia area, uh, which is one of our newer house churches. You know, they don't even have an outdoor show. Everybody just walks out in the bush and goes to the bathroom. Uh, even though they may have a brick house, they still see no point in having a uh, bathroom. And uh, so, you know, we have to literally show them how to bathe out of a bucket and show them how to use. We have a drop pit type of um, latrine, and but they have to be shown how to use that and, there's hygiene issues that, you know, they don't do things the way we would have them do things. And we're not interested in making everyone Western, but we are interested in keeping them from disease. So we, we do address health issues, hygiene issues, and, uh, and things like that. We typically, every week, we have people that are um, in dire need of medical care. Uh, God heals people here as we pray for them. And at other times, um, I'll give you an example where a lady had a tooth pulled, infected the whole right side of her head, infection spread into her, uh, apparently into her brain, did a CAT scan, now we find out there's a tumor also. And uh, so, you know, we, we're taking people to the, to the hospital almost weekly, and if not sending them to the hospital, certainly weekly. Uh, we, we try to help the surrounding community with, uh, with needs. We're real big on helping the least of these, our brothers. We want to help the widow, the orphan, the sick, those in jail, the naked and the hungry. Uh, and we do it every single day, uh, sometimes almost all of those. We're not working with the jail right now, but you get the idea. At the same time, our ministry focused is discipleship and evangelism. 
but we do these other things as we go. So we're not like out there looking for widows and looking for orphans and looking for hungry people to feed. It's it's just we don't walk by a situation without stopping, you know, particularly if it's severe. And we also try never say no if someone comes and asks. You would think we'd be covered up in a poor country with people lined up down the street coming to ask because they know we'll help. But I can't explain it. But in this country and in this culture, that doesn't happen. Uh, I may get five or six people a week come up and ask me uh, for some kind of assistance. But things are very inexpensive here. A doctor's visit may cost $3. A hospital surgery may cost $200 may even be 50. A small amount of money goes a long way, so we're blessed to be able to say yes uh, to almost everything. We don't say yes to everything, but we almost do. And in other areas, we have other remedies. Um, A lot of times people come and just want a handout, and we just put them to work. A lot of times they turn out to be good, really good workers, and they bring skills, and they want to stay, and we figure out how to engage them we're also um we create jobs um for people we will occasionally start a small business for someone particularly a widow and we are exploring right now other opportunities there's a uh, an opportunity to distribute some uh, some some uh, chickens uh there's a business model we're looking into right now that would allow us to uh, kind of start guys off uh, with some chicken product, some young chicks to go sell, and maybe even a bicycle. But once they carry out the first load and sell their first group of chickens, then they have income to begin to buy chickens from us, which will provide jobs for people here on the Shamba, and also income for them as they go out and sell. They typically go to market and come back so that as we lead men to the Lord and disciple them, they have tons of free time then to do Luke 10's evangelism and still be able to support their family. Our goal with working people is to is for them to make enough money working with their hands to provide for their family, not be a burden on the church, and have enough left over to help others. You're listening to an interview with Glenn Roseberry, missionary to Africa from KingdomDriven.org. What's it like? in the day-to-day life of being a missionary in the bush-slash-jungles of Africa, continuing on. We are surrounded by the prosperity gospel, and um, one of our, um, what would I say, one of our kind of shields against having people come to us to be with the rich white guy, which we're known as Mzungu in the singular and Wazungu in the plural. It's a real challenge. Uh, Most missionaries come here and just get inundated with con artists and people want to get rich by being with a white guy. Part of the reason I live poor with the poor, to reach the poor, is uh, by living this way, people go, we don't know what's wrong with this Mzungu because he don't live like a Mzungu. He must be broke, so we can't get any money out of him. And so they (laughs) they don't gravitate to me. like they do a, a lot of my uh, missionary friends and other uh, Mzungu or Wazungu in the area that come here with big programs and big budgets. Uh, I came here with a tiny budget, $500 a month from my church, $200 a month and other donations, and excuse me, $300 a month and other donations, and that 200 of that went away in the first 90 days when one of my supporters fell on hard times. So obviously I didn't have a lot of money to take care of myself and anyone else, Although $500 here in Tanzania is a very good living, uh, if you're willing to live like an African, it's insufficient if you want to live like a Westerner, of course. But if you're willing to live like an African, then you uh, have plenty of money. And in fact, you're, you're, you're middle class, uh, solid middle class, if not upper middle class, as long as you're willing to live like an African in a, you know, uh, in, in conditions where you may or may not have running water and may or may not have windows and doors that close and lock. And, you know, if you live like them, it's great. And you have plenty of money to help others. And that's what we chose to do. Choosing to, to live this way, uh, it, it's kind of a shield. And uh, and as people come and, and they do come to the Lord and we call them to discipleship and they're they're counting the cost, You know, we pretty much tell them that there is no getting rich with us, that we have chosen to basically live in what the world calls poverty in order to extend the kingdom of God. 
And if they're going to come and be a disciple of Jesus, we call them to the same life. So, uh, you know, there's no salaries here. We all work with our hands. We all pay our own way. And uh, we all work. And then we spend half of our time uh, that you would consider time other than at home at night with your families. Half of the time is spent literally going to the lost and or taking care of the least of these, our brothers. So that's kind of what a day looks like at the end of the day. I uh, I will fix myself something to eat. I uh, uh, pretty much only, uh, I only eat between about, say, 2 in the afternoon and 6. That's just my lifestyle. I pretty much do intermittent fasting during the day. So when I come home, I may grab something while I'm out late in the afternoon, and then I come home at night, and typically I eat eggs from my own shamba and, uh, you know, drink my own goat's milk. And um, so um, I live a very simple life. And as I shared earlier, uh, I would typically um, be in my bed at 7.30 at night, try to take care of uh, any um, uh, stuff in my interaction with Westerners, either very early in the morning, as I'm doing now, or very late at night, uh, which for me, it means after dark. <laughs> I know that's quite a paradigm shift for most of you. <laughs> it's dark. It's time to go to bed. I am engaged with one-on-one -on -one discipleship, a core group of seven men here in this country. Uh, I have another core group of four or five men in Kenya, uh, and then kind of a secondary group in Western Kenya I won't get into. Those are the guys I pour my life into while uh, basically overseeing two house churches personally at this point. And that always stays kind of constant. I move on after I get those going and leadership is in place and, and that kind of thing, and they're self-sufficient which, of course, is the goal in discipleship, then I would move on to, to more startup house churches. And uh, that's kind of what my week looks like there. And that's kind of what a day looks like. Very, uh, very much spending time running all my chores, eating all my meals, working side by side, and praying and sharing my faith. Always, anytime I share, I never would share with anybody without a disciple beside me. Because every time I do what God's called me to do, I got to be training another guy to do what I'm doing. And so uh, I counsel with someone sitting beside me, unless it's, you know, a situation where you can't. Uh, whenever I share my faith, I have guys beside me. Whenever I teach, I have guys beside me. Uh, when I'm talking to the lost, when I'm talking to other disciples, uh, I am always discipling someone else. And uh, and then, like Jesus would do, after you're through with that process, then you withdraw with that guy. You would spend time recapping what you just went over and why you did. And then, of course, I am a perpetual student, not only in language and culture, but also in, in, in getting feedback from my guys, where they're at, and what God's doing in their lives. I'm 62. I am not immortal. And uh, I plan on dying in the saddle, <laughs> as it were. And by the grace of God, if I'm able to continue to lie my 80, my dad is uh, 83 and 84, mom and dad, and uh, they're in quite good health. And I would love to be able to continue to do what I'm doing. I'm in way better shape than they were at my age. So who knows what God has for me. But I would like to, uh, uh, to do this until I can. And uh, that is my plan. But at some point, Glenn comes to an end. And uh, we pray that the, the gospel of the kingdom and the and the disciples that we've made will continue to resonate from what we do and what we've invested our life in for generations to come. It's my hope, though, that I stay in the background so much and my disciples become so prominent in what we do that uh, we say all the time that we hope that at some point, as our disciples make disciples, we make disciples that make other disciples, and it just keeps going out in an ever-broadening circle or rings, as it were, out into the community and the country, the nation, the world, that uh, they won't even know who started this thing, that uh, they'll know the guy that led them to the Lord and maybe two guys above him, but nobody will even know there was a Mzungu came to Africa one day, and uh, I just assume uh, they just think this whole thing started here, and and uh, it didn't have anything to do with me. And uh, that would be, as far as I'm concerned, mission accomplished. It shouldn't be about the missionary. It shouldn't be about the white guy, that's for sure. It's got to be about the Lord. We pray that his Holy Spirit would be in what we're doing. And we consecrate ourselves every day 
so that we are following him, we're not just going along hoping he's blessing what we're doing. We're following the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we're following the model and example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that left us in Scripture. We believe he was the master disciple maker. We believe there's never been one like him before or since. We love reading about what the apostles did. Paul, of course, left us an incredible legacy of uh, relating to Timothy and Silas and Titus and Barnabas and Mark and constant letters being sent here and there and messengers being sent. And, um, you read the letters as from a perspective of a disciple making. You see things you never saw when you were just interested in theology. You're like, man, I was talking to a brother the other day and we were laughing. Uh, we were saying, you know, we used to read Corinthians and we go, oh, this is great. This is an interesting truth. And what do you think about this theologically? And now we read it and we go, man, Paul's got the same problems we had. Praise God. Look in Galatians. It's running into the same thing we're running into. And uh, and what we find it is this Bible isn't this doctrinal instruction guy that so many in the West see it as. But this is like practical day-to-day -day, how to make disciples, how to handle problems. Uh, every issue they ran into in the New Testament, I've run into in the field. I kid you not. Uh, the perspective we have on scripture is so different here. And, and well, I made disciples in America too. But the scripture, when you start making disciples, man, talk about the New Testament coming alive. Because all these issues Paul dealt with, you know, people in Thessalonians thought the Lord was coming back. So there's no point in really working. You know, it's okay. People in Corinthians not taking communion correctly. The rich thinking they were entitled, uh, neglecting the poor, as James mentioned. Um, and, uh, man, I could just go on and on. Every problem they ran, sexual immorality that Paul ran into in Corinthians. Trust me, I'm in cultures where polygamy is practiced. And uh, if not formal polygamy, uh, sexual um, uh, misconduct is rampant. Uh, even among church members. And so, I, you know, I hear people say, oh, that Corinthian church was a mess. I said, uh, actually, the Corinthian church is just a church, just like every other church when you go to a culture that was not based on Judaism. So when you went to the Greek culture, that's what Paul ran into. Well, guess what happens when I run into an animus culture? Exactly what Paul ran into. So I know exactly what he's talking about. Now, wasn't that amazing? There's going to be more to come. This is a multi-part series, so be sure to stay tuned. If you want to follow Glenn, I'm including the links to his Facebook page, personal account, and also a link to kingdomdriven.org. That's kingdomdriven.org. These links will be included wherever you hear this podcast. Just be sure to check out the show notes. Stay tuned. There's more to come. To we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.